All right, everyone. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and it is so lovely to see you back here on the Friday Masterclass, where today we're going to be talking about the most interesting of all topics, <laughs> how to optimize your editing experience. You know, it's a new year. A lot of people have acquired new cameras, working with new formats. You know, a plan to shoot video, shoot it, make it bigger, 4K, 6K, 8K, 12K, whatever you're working in. And of course, you know, maybe you got the new gear, maybe you got the new camera, maybe you got some new glass, but you might be working on that machine from last year, or maybe it's a couple of years old. In fact, I'm working on a, you know, three and a half year old iMac here. So regardless, and as powerful as your machine may be, there are definitely things that you can do just to make the general experience better, even if you're shooting stuff on the iPhone. And that's not saying little because, of course, iPhone shoots 4K. You can shoot 60, 120, 240 frames. Now you've got HDR color and all these things kind of contribute to, you know, ultimately slowing you down if you don't really optimize the project right from the start. Now, these are just suggestions. You can do what you want. And of course, one of the nice things about Premiere is that it works natively with pretty much every file format. So you never really have to create proxies or transcode or do many of the things that I'm going to show you. But as you get better and more advanced in your editing, as you begin to add and augment your edit with color, with sound design, with graphics, with motion graphics templates, either through the essential graphics panel or dynamically linked directly from After Effects, you're going to find that you're going to start to want to make things a little bit smoother and really optimize them so that your experience is the same, whether you're scrubbing, you know, 6K with graphics and titles and sound design, or, you know, going through the archives of some old 720p or 1080p footage and just kind of, you know, putting a comp together and sticking it on an archive drive somewhere, uh, somewhere in your room or somewhere in the cloud. As always, of course, we're coming to you live on uh, Adobe Live, Behance, YouTube, and Twitter Periscope. So thank you so much for joining. A couple quick hellos here. So you've got Umicorn, Reverb Mike, Pulp Music, Yasin, Picked, Afrosia, Mallory, Wade, how's it going, Richard? All right, very glad to hear that AE took care of the recent update of AE took care of that problem for you. And we've got Ferry, we've got uh, Jason Humes coming in. Des Winter, how's it going? Uh, Copra, very nice. And thank you so much, Copra, for that nice comment. Very, very cool. And Martin Rivera, hello from South America. Of course, I'll be following the chat over at behance.net slash Adobe Live. So if you want to be in the chat that's right in front of my face, <laughs> uh, please go ahead and just sign in there. All right. Standard def flashback to the 90s, Reverb Mike says. Curious, I'm going to end today's stream uh, with a little bit of a 90s flashback. In fact, this little diversion here. But um, some of you know, uh, since the new year, Manic Jack, what's up? New aspiring editor. Um, I've been going back and kind of well, I redid a bunch of stuff in the studio. I've been rediscovering some old archives. I tossed a whole bunch of old cables and digital gear and random just drives and just crap from, you know, 20, 30 years of working in studios, owning studios, and just being a general gear hog for a very long period of that time. But I had all these masters that were on DAT, digital audio tape, and I have a DA30 Mach 2 uh, down here that I plan to use yesterday. Turned it on, got things going, and uh, guess what happened? Nothing. It wouldn't play. I got an error, and I was pissed, to say the least. <laughs> and the error was something to do with the drive mechanism, which means can't really fi fix it myself. Well, I don't have the audio for you here. I'll, I'll, I'll do uh, a stream. Actually, next week I'm doing all audio streams, like five days. So you're going to get to hear and see a lot of the stuff. But this will just show you here. There's no sound on this. So the DA30 died. I had this Tascam port of DAT that I've had for, again, like 25 years. And uh, there you're seeing it, playing back the DATs with time code, beautiful level meters. You can see one of the tapes right there. <laughs> uh, and it's all working. It's all good. So very excited to, uh, to be. Oh, you couldn't see it just now because I didn't switch over my screen. Oh, God, it's going to be one of those days already. I can tell. But here it is. The DA uh, P1 port of DAT, playing back tape, meters, absolute time, indexing program numbers, and I added a couple of new cameras here. By the way, I'm just going to show you this real quickly. So, um, you know, one of the one of the key elements of working with DATs and things was how you labeled everything. And 
you always really, I mean, I, maybe you were different than I was, but you know, if you got it, dats were expensive. So, you know, what would happen is you'd, you'd label them. Let me switch over to this camera here. All right. And you can see I'd start, uh, the light's not going to be my friend here, but I'd start labeling. Let's see if we can get in and see. So, you know, and these would just kind of list out the takes and this was in 94 or five. So I think I had a 24 track digital studio then, but you'd use like all the space to label everything and really use like the whole dat, you know, very seldom would I take a 60 or 90 minute dat and only use 10 minutes of it. That just wasn't okay. You know, you had to, you had to use everything. <laughs> At least in the studios that I worked in and the ones that I owned, you know, there will be no waste of digital audio tape. It was expensive. So uh, in any case, it was really fun to actually rediscover these things. In fact, I relocated a whole bunch of masters um, on this very dat that I'm holding in front of me here that I had completely forgotten about. A couple of records worth of stuff that I wrote and produced with my oft co-writer, Fred Fung, Fet Fung, who you can find on Spotify with me. Oh my gosh, totally forgot about this stuff. I mean, it's 25 years old, 23 in this case for these, some of these. Um, long, totally forgotten. I'm listening to these things going, oh my God, wow. There's this thing where I'm playing draw, jazz. Like I'm playing jazz drums. I can play jazz drums, but I don't, that's, I'm not really a jazz drummer, definitely a rock drummer. Um, Wow, it was so cool. And it was great to hear them. And they sounded awesome. I mean, they were great. So anyway, that'll be next week. Let's go to premiere. Thank you for giving me that little seven minute diversion there. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Ah, oh, very good. Okay. I'm just checking the chats here. What's up, Gus? How are you doing? All right. Richard, you had eight tracks back then. Oh, yeah. I, uh... I started early and went right, you know, when DA88 kind of hit, I had this this studio that became a huge demo studio in Nashville. We had 24 tracks of DA88 and it was freaking solid. Oh, it was so wonderful. We were so busy, we just turned people away. That's 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 what it was like then. And then within a few years, uh, you know, I, I couldn't give sessions away because everything kind of went home digital, you know? non-linear and uh, anybody could do it. And then you just, it just dried up almost instantly. Okay, so we're gonna start in Premiere here and we're gonna start really from just creating the new project. Now, as I mentioned, one of the best things that you can do is to um, really set yourself up in the beginning <laughs> for success. That's how, that is a very marketing-y kind of thing to say, but really, kind of just prepare everything so that you don't have to think about optimizations afterwards. And this is a good kind of mode to get into. So the first thing is here, we're just gonna make a dummy project here. So this is um, Galaxian footage, I think. Oh, by the way, speaking of other camera angles, so uh, I, I showed you this one last week. We've actually used this angle before, but you may notice a new addition right here. Um, and on the other, this is, there's Galaxian up here. These are my original 1981, uh, uh, video game systems, my my mother restored these for me about a decade ago. So they work, they're awesome, uh, they're super fun. And while I don't like things augmenting my studio space, my older son was like, yeah, dad, those would be cool. So I decided to keep them up there. Okay, so we're gonna call this Galaxian. We're gonna stick it on, uh, let's stick it on the desktop. Do I have a, oh, I do actually have a remove folder. That's good. <laughs> this is stuff which I ultimately plan on discarding. So that's cool. All right, now video rendering and playback. Now we've talked about this a lot. Again, this will be slightly different if you're on uh, a Windows system or a Mac system, either of which may have NVIDIA CUDA cards. So you'll see another CUDA GPU acceleration option here. The default for Mac is metal. Um, do you ever wanna go into software only? Typically no, because then you don't get the benefits of GPU acceleration. Again, for those of you unfamiliar, many, not all, but many of our effects and processes are GPU accelerated, meaning that we use the RAM on your GPU to do the processing. So all of Lumetri Color, GPU accelerated. Um, I think a couple of the, the blurs, certainly Gaussian blur, I think is GPU accelerated. Quite a few effects and things are GPU accelerated, which is good because it takes the load off the CPU. 
you typically want that enabled. If you do software only, there's no acceleration. So if you're not doing anything with effects or processing, just kind of passing through and doing straight cuts, software only can, can be fine. It will be slower though than using one of the GPU accelerated methods, all right? So that's really the first thing. And that's enabled by default. You'd have to manually change that. Now, color management down here, this is not going to apply to too many of you, but you know, we did some recent additions. In fact, I, I talked to this last week, uh, adding some new HDR capabilities specifically for broadcasters. So if you're working in uh, a color space beyond Rec. 709, you, leveraging HDR, here's where you can set your HDR white level here. And you can see it kind of gives you the percentages of HLG and PQ uh, for color management right inside of this dialog. So again, most of you will never have to deal with this, but this is where you can find those settings and set them for the project before you begin. Now, much like uh, Photoshop and many other apps, of course, we have this little scratch disk tab here. And a lot of people never really bother to go here. And generally you don't have to, but it's worth being aware of where all that stuff is and what all that stuff is. So first and foremost, if you capture video, very few of us probably doing that, but it tells you it's going into the, again, same as project. That's kind of the default for everything. So captured video, audio, video and audio previews, auto saves. Now this is different because this used to, I think by default, a couple of versions ago, go to your creative cloud folder, which, you know, many of you said, look, that's not ideal. One, maybe I'm not even on the internet with my editing system. Two, I don't need to be pinging CC, you know, just for a project auto save. We heard you. I agree. You can change it to anything you want. Okay. But it typically will go into the same location as the project. And then the last two are CC libraries downloads. Okay. So that's anything that you're downloading or inserting into your project from CC libraries. And that can be a combination of, you know, stock video, um, or, uh, or audio, because now you have audio support in CC libraries or any kind of graphical elements that you have in there, as well as a specific location for motion graphics templates. So Mogurts. So again, um, when you download a, a Mogurt or add a Mogurt to your project, it actually gets downloaded to the project folder. Okay. So really kind of important just to know where all that stuff's going and, you know, for ease of finding media, keeping things clean, simple, you know, again, especially like preview files, which can get pretty big, right? If you're going to pre-render and we'll talk about that in a moment, using preview files to your advantage, you want to know where that stuff is. We used to put it in, you know, user folder, user, Adobe, Premiere, version 14, media, something else. That's fine. And some things still go into some of those locations, but it can, it can confuse things real easily if you're trying to like clean up, optimize, speed up and clear off projects that you've been working on. And I'm, I do this all the time. Like last weekend, I said I had a spring clean in December, in January, probably going to do another one this week. And I just love minimizing, dump it to Mount Grump it, get rid of it, which is appropriate by the way, because I'm wearing Grinch socks. Can you see the Grinch? Oh, you can't even see the Grinch. You can kind of see the Grinch. That's where my, <laughs> well, that was an epic fail of an, ex of a, ah, forget it. Just trying to show off my Grinch socks. Thanks, Stance. Why is there no Grinch face on the bottom? Sheesh. Anyway, third thing here are ingest settings. All right. Now, typically I don't even tell people to bother doing this or starting this, but in the last week alone, I've had so many, many users say, hey, I just got, you know, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K, 6K camera, whatever. You know, I've got the new Sony, I'm shooting 4K. 4K, 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 4K. 4K is the standard. Whether or not you deliver 4K, and I'm the first to say, pretty much every video on my YouTube channel, with the exception of one or two, is 1080. They may have been shot and edited in 4K, but ultimately delivered at 1080. Many times shot in 4K, I'll make my sequence 1080 so that way I can, you know, recompose and reframe and stuff like that. But even still, the master media is 4K. And 4K, depending upon where it's coming from, it can be pretty heavy, right? And if you don't have it on the fastest drives, if you don't have the best sort of asynchronous access, then ingesting and creating proxies of your media, smaller lightweight versions, 
can really help you when you're editing and just get the media struggle out of the way, all right? Again, if you're just editing a single clip, don't bother with this. If you're cutting something that's gonna have a lot of clips, proxies are really necessary. Now, there's always the question, well, isn't that gonna eat up a lot of space on my drives? Yeah, it may, depending upon the format and things you choose, but at the expense of, if you don't use them, things will be kind of slow and you'll get frustrated. If you do use them, things will be zippy and fast, and then when you're done with the project, archive it or just dump the proxies if you don't want them, all right? So you have options here. To enable this, and I'm gonna recommend this, let's go ahead and turn on ingest, all right? Now you've got a couple options here, copy, transcode, create proxy, copy and create proxy. I already have the media on a drive, uh, uh, um, a NAS here, so, I'm going to simply create proxies, all right? I don't need to make copies or anything. This master media is where I want it to be, all right? Now, you get to choose a preset. Now, I have a couple of master classes from last year where I talked to and showed you the somewhat long and slightly convoluted way of creating ingest presets. And it's a good idea to make your own custom ones because then you can add things like a logo bug or maybe you want all of your ingested media to have time code on it. Again, a good way to indicate like this is the proxy versus the native media that doesn't have time code. Or maybe you want to add some kind of a LUT, right? Some kind of a, a, a display LUT, because maybe especially if you're Sony, and I know my buddy Howard just started shooting, uh, just started shooting S-Log on his uh, A7S III. You know, S-Log to a client is going to look terrible. <laughs> I've not worked with one non-video person who's seen log footage and was like, oh yeah, that's awesome. The first comment always says, ooh, why is it so creamy? Why is there no color? Why is it soft? Why is it? <laughs> so maybe you wanna put a display LUD on there. Point is you can make your own presets. For now, we're just going to use the default ones. And if you're going to use a proxy preset for the purpose of optimizing and speeding up your editing workflow, I would recommend these ProRes ones right here. And most specifically, I probably go with the low resolution ProRes proxy, all right? Smallest version, lightest version. It's gonna be zippity za fast. It's gonna be smaller, take up less disk space. And ProRes files are native to Mac and Windows running Premiere. Now, a lot of people ask, well, if I want it as small as possible, shouldn't I use H.264? Yeah, well, yes, it'll be smaller. However, and even though we now have accelerated encoding and decoding for H.264, particularly on Windows, H.264, is, it's, it was never meant to be an editing format, right? So even for years, for me, I've been making proxies in ProRes of my DSLR mirrorless .movie files, which are H.264 compression, because, yeah, it, it wasn't really meant to be an editing format. It's just not the best. And you know, if you start scrubbing around lots of 4K H.264, yeah, it doesn't necessarily perform really well. So we have those in there. I don't recommend using them. DNxHR, either for um, just regular media, or in this case, you can see we've got presets specific to VR in any resolution. This is night and day. And I, again, you can go back to a previous masterclass where I showed how to work in 360. I'm using DX, DNxHR proxies on 6K VR media on this system that we have here. It is insane. It, it makes the whole experience doable. Without it, Frankly, nightmare. <laughs> I mean, VR is a bit of a nightmare anyway. I don't care what system you're on. I don't care what you're editing. It's just, I don't love it, but that doesn't matter. It's not a great experience editing. If you use the proxy files though, it feels like HD, all right? So there's really no loss to you. ProRes, low-res proxy. Gonna look, at, uh, gonna look at some comments here. Reverb Mike, when will Premiere do H.265? Well, we do. You can export H.265, of course. You can import H.265. Again, not an ideal format for editing, right? High efficiency in that it looks great as a delivery, small, a little smaller than H.264, still not wonderful when encoding, right? And the decode is, again, not the greatest. So, I don't know. Maybe soon, maybe never. I'm not really sure what the what the take is on that. All right. Oh, Jorge, workspace best layout. And by the way, you called me Adam Jorge, which happens to be my middle name, oddly enough. All right. 
Okay. And Mike says, Re Premiere plays your 4K videos great. Yes, and it, it, it does. But again, how many? Four layers of 4K? Eight, two, one, you know, it's different for everybody. Is the scratch disk, Mallory is asking, where you would go if you're having trouble when rendering a video that slows down with Mogerts? That happens to me and I have a good computer system. Um, I mean, there may be things that are being written to the scratch disk. A lot of times, you know, uh, when you're saying it's having trouble, are you saying that it just, it, it gets slower? I mean, the thing is with Mogerts, especially if they're After Effects authored, it, it, yeah, it can take a while and it just depends on the complexity of the Mogert. Now that's a perfect example sometimes of where I might use a pre-render if it is kind of in a critical moment and things are not gonna change. You know, you can pre-render the motion graphics template in the Premiere timeline to save that headache after the fact and it'll use all the resources to do that pre-render so it'll be even faster than when you're doing it at the end. But we'll get to that in a little bit, all right? If your scratch disk is removable, can you remove it and replace it? Will you lose the data or will it be rebuilt on the net? Yeah, so that's a great question. So yes, if, if it can't find the scratch disk, I don't remember it either, I can't remember if it prompts you to find it or if it, uh, certainly it will automatically recreate somewhere to dump everything. But if it can't find the one that's native to the project, it probably asks you to relocate. I haven't moved any of that stuff in a lot. Again, I'm always keeping it in that native location so it doesn't move around. My sense is if it doesn't ask to relink, it's going to rebuild it anyway from wherever the default location was, was set to. All right. Okay. Yes, yes. Very good. All right. What is H.264 basically asks Ferry. So yeah, so H.264, it's just a compressed video file format, right, meant for delivery. So instead of using something like ProRes or DNxHR or um, you know any other number of uncompressed or lossless formats, H.264, not unlike MP3 for audio, is a lossy video delivery format that uses MPEG-based uh, uh, encoding, all right? Very cool. Okay. Let's go. All right. So we're gonna salute, salute. We're gonna choose our ProRes low resolution proxy. Click okay, we're all in the right place. And now we're in Premiere Pro. Okay, now somebody was just asking about workspaces. And now while this isn't something which necessarily defines performance, it can certainly be something that kind of defines your, your UI UX experience, right? So, First and foremost, um, and I do like to point out that we have all these workspaces here, okay? And you can see I've got a couple of custom ones that I add and change. All of these, by the way, which I know I haven't synced in a while, all of your workspaces um, <laughs> haven't synced in a while, he says. <laughs> you see that? <laughs> I haven't synced my workspaces in over a year. There you go. Uh... I would sync them now, but I'm not going to. Workspaces are really a great way to just get rid of the clutter, right? So, you know, this, I have this kind of color, you know, BEMC is Behance Masterclass. So that's what this one, this, that's what this means. Um, and I have access to Lumetri Color, Essential Sound, Essential Graphics. And this is like, again, the common stuff that I'm showing for the Masterclass. Uh, you can see that again, in this particular workspace, I have myself perfectly housed in the bottom left corner and all the panels are done accordingly. You know, the nice thing about our workspaces is that everything can be docked and moved. If you wanna undock a panel, you know, you can move it around freely. If you have multiple monitors, you can, the workspaces will respect the location of assets across multiple monitors. So there's a lot of flexibility here with customizing the workspace. And then it's just as simple as, either saving changes to an existing one, so maybe you just want to overwrite, or creating a new one. And then when you have um, a particular, you know, layout of workspaces that you like, then you can edit that workspace bar, right? So in edit workspaces, this is what you're seeing here. This is what's being displayed up at the top. So for instance, I'm gonna do this right now. I don't need max one there anymore. Uh, I don't need, 
I don't need the learning one there because I it just it just it's clutter for me. I've been meaning to take that out. And I don't want this color because I have my custom color one. And then those just go into an overflow menu. And then you can even see there's like do not show. So meta logging, yeah, that one I, I don't like. All panels, never use that. Max one, that's old, so we can not show that. Or I could delete them, right? I mean, you have all these options here. So workspaces, absolutely. It's not, I mean, we have them everywhere, right? You have them in Photoshop, you have them in After Effects. It's, it's just a great way to customize what you need and what you need to see, right? If you don't need to see color, sound, graphics, level meters, the media browser, the library panel, scopes and everything else, then take them out. Don't leave them on because all of these panels, especially ones that have any kind of animation, right? They're taking up resources. Okay, so let's import some media, all right? So again, I can simply double click inside of my project panel here to begin importing media. And for this stuff, I'm going to go to an old drive. I mentioned the Galaxian stuff. Okay, and let's do these by name. And let's grab these eight or so files, okay? And you can see these were all shot quite some time ago. Look at that, oh my God, nine years ago. Well, technically eight, you know, eight and a bit. Now we're gonna click import. Okay, now remember that we set this up to begin creating proxies. So when I import the media, it comes into Premiere, all right? By the way, I just updated everything, so that's why you're seeing verifying media encoder. Because what's happening is, it's launching media encoder in the background, and it's going to begin building proxy files, our smaller, lightweight versions of our media, in the background. So if I click over to media encoder, it's still loading here. Probably should have uh, made sure that that was gonna work ahead of time. Let me just go ahead, I'm just going to create a new sequence from this clip, all right? Let me just disable the audio. Let's see, meeting coders up, there we go, okay. So what you're seeing now is that it's now beginning to create proxies. It's still doing some configuration or something here. But while it's doing that, I still have complete access to all of this media as it is. So I can begin editing right away. I don't, I don't have to wait. There's nothing I need to do um, before I can start editing. So that's one of the most brilliant things about this. Now. As you're seeing, it's creating those proxies in the background. So while it's doing that, it's gonna take a sec. Let me go into the, um, the metadata display here. And I wanna make sure that I have proxy enabled as one of the fields. It is now, all right, let's go into the list view. Let's make this full screen. Where is proxy? It's all the way at the end here, all right? So do you see what's happening now? It's showing you which of these files it's already attached the proxy to. If it says offline, that means it hasn't been authored yet or it's, it's not there. It'll be there any second. But all of this is happening in the background. Look, it's almost done now. It's on the last one already. So my point is we don't have to do anything. We can start right away reviewing, editing files, whatever it is immediately and the proxies are being generated in the background. And now you can see that all of those proxies have been generated. By the way, the reason you're seeing these uh, sub clips right here. So when I did this footage back in 2012, um, I used to use Adobe Prelude to do all of my marking and metadata logging and tagging. So you can see I made sub clips of like selects, um, all of which have these labels, right? That's why there's all this. And the point of that was that uh, if you go into like the marker panel here, just to kind of show you, you know, um, if I wanted to search, now this particular clip only had, you know, this this only had, let's see, does any of these have more than one? Oh, so this one has a couple. So yeah, so if I were like searching on, you know, logo or depth of field. You know, I use specific terms when I log and, and catalog my media. You can use the search here, you know, to find those things. Oh, they both have logo in it. All right. Um, to find, you know, specific metadata in a file and go right to that clip in time 
uh, using the marker panel. So that's that's what all that is in there. All right, just so you're aware. Okay. Now, now that we've done that, how do we make sure that we're using proxies? Because you may not necessarily visually be able to see it. And this is why customizing a preset is a good idea. And I see Richard Adams is saying you don't rename your files. Now, again, if you're using something like Adobe Prelude for ingest, for transcoding specifically, Prelude gives you the option to do all kinds of complex renaming, you know, file management. Uh, you can do multiple variations of transcodes. So you can make all of your proxies, and then maybe you're going to make duplicate copies in another format, and then maybe you're going to create a master archive of the original media in ProRes 444 for, you know, for, for um, online purposes or something. You can do all of that in Prelude simultaneously. Okay, and then from Premiere, instead of building the proxy here, you would simply, you have the native media in Premiere already. You would go up to here, so I'll just like choose a file here. You would go to the proxy menu, and then you would say attach proxies. So in that case, Richard, so if you did it in Prelude where you're doing all this advanced renaming and whatnot, this is going to allow you to attach those proxies. It's It'll take a second, you know. Um, and then you're good to go. By the way, you can also see we now have detached proxies. This was something that people have been asking for for ages because there was no official way to detach proxies other than, I think even if you deleted them from the project and saved, it still thought there may be proxies, like that it wanted proxy files. So now you have a, a way to just easily detach them, which is really useful, okay? Very cool, okay. And yes, in general, I'm not, uh, oh, hey, what's up, Terry White? Just watching Terry before, Terry kind of in the spirit of Terry's, we're doing these like, you know, how to really optimize and get started in Lightroom today. That was, dude, that was so great. And actually, once again, learned a couple of new tricks when you were showing uh, some of the select subject and specifically the, the match color stuff with, um, what were you using? It wasn't a blur. It was, oh, were you averaged? the colors in, in the mask and then uh, and then adjusted the opacity. Oh, dude, you blew my mind. I'm gonna have to go back and watch it again. Anyway, check out Terry's streams, of course, here, masterclasses on Adobe Live. Uh, and you can also check out terrywhite.com and his YouTube channel, great stuff there. And uh, Good to see you, man. Okay. Okay, so proxies. So in your button editor, which is this little thing right here, you have a button that looks like this. Now you may not see this button by default. This is your proxy button, okay? If you don't have it on by default, go into the button editor, find that toggle proxy button, and drag it down into your buttons, okay? By the way, talking about just like optimizing and cleaning things up, fewer buttons, keep only the ones you need on screen. You can always add more, all right? I said last week there was a period where every one of these buttons used to be displayed by default. What a, what a crazy, crazy scene. When it's blue, that means that we're working with proxies. Now, what if you're editing and you're like, okay, you know what? I want to try playing this back. I want to just see this in full quality, full 4K, full whatever. I'm, I'm reviewing my color correction. How do I reconnect it to the native media? Well, there is no reconnection. That's the beauty of our proxy system. You simply uncheck it. And when it's gray, you're now in native media. When it's blue, you're using proxy. And you can see you're not even seeing a great visual difference. That's because we're using ProRes proxies. Now, if I were going, this is also 1080p. If I were going from 8K or, or even 4K to something like a ProRes LT or something really small, you might have a visual indicate, a better visual indication that you were working off of a proxy file. So this is why if you go back and check out creating ingest presets, a lot of people like to put, you know, proxy along the bottom or a logo bug so that they know that they're working off of different media. The cool thing is you don't have to worry about when you're exporting, if you accidentally uh, are in proxy mode, because by default, it'll always use the high resolution media um, for export. However, if you do want to export with the proxy media, we now have a specific checks, a checkbox in the media encoder, use proxies, which allows you to do that. So we've kind of given you both options there, it makes it super easy. All right. Okay, Mallory, I think I'm gonna spend some serious time going back to the 2020 master classes and may find some help with my issue. Yeah, I mean, just just remember, um, average under blur. Thank you, Terry, that was it. Just remember, Mallory, you know, a lot of times, 
you know, and again, it's one of those, like I was talking with someone yesterday and we were talking about um, disc requirements for edits. You know, here, I'm gonna go to the camera view for a second. And um, look, if you have super fast discs, that's great. And you should, if you're working in 4K or beyond. But if your capacity of those discs is largely uh, uh, unavailable, so you got like a terabyte or two terabytes of SSD, but you've only got 500 gigs free or you know less, your performance will suffer. It's not an absolute, but in general, for best performance, regardless of drive type, you want at a minimum half of the total available drive size available for like your editing. So if you're working on a, a, a two terabyte drive, ideally, again, it's not an absolute, ideally you want about a terabyte free especially if that's where your scratch disk stuff is going for optimal performance. Again, that's not an absolute. Terry and I joke about it all the time. I, there's a period where, you know, again, towards the end of the year, because we're doing a lot of stuff on the native drive, I'll check get info and it's down to, you know, 300 gigs, you know, and it's a two terabyte internal. <laughs> that's bad, right? That's on me. And by the way, we're going to talk about that now. That includes cache files and media files and all this other stuff that gets saved and cached in the background that you may not be deleting. Now, there are ways to auto delete it and there's some reason why you wanna keep it all. Go, go there in just a second, but the stuff adds up. So it could be something as simple as that, Mallory. It could be that, hey, you know, you're, you're, you're just using a lot of processing. It could be, you know, again, if you're doing stuff with log footage or doing conversions, there's a lot of factors potentially involved, but hit me up directly if you want more help with this and we can, we can investigate it um, in a couple of different ways. All right, cool. Jörg Michaelis from Cologne, hello, thank you so much for joining. Okay, so you got your proxies on, everything is great. And like I said, when you've got proxies, you are, I mean, you are definitely, you're, you're, you're cooking with gas as they, as they say, I don't like expressions, but you really are because it just, what it's telling you is that, you know, your, your performance, your scrubbing, you know, it's as real time as it gets and, and nobody wants real time. And by the way, it's worth pointing out, I'm in full res playback here, okay? And Terry knows we're, we're always kind of working in 4K, um, you know, and actually I'm getting good performance without the proxy at the moment, but I don't have anything on these. All right, if I start adding color and again, adjustment layers and other things, it could potentially suffer or just get a little slower. And you know what? That little change annoys us, right? It does, it annoys me. You've seen me on stream. I constantly wanna throw things at the lap, at the machine. All right, so you get it. Okay, so while we're here, let's talk about, we were just talking about cache and stuff. Since, since it got brought up, let's talk about that. So we're gonna go into preferences media cache, okay? Now your media cache is a little bit different than your um, than your scratch disk and that it saves a couple of other types of files there by default. Curiously, there's no way I changed this. I'm noticing now that this is going to a Lightroom video folder. That's the default. That's, there's no way I set that manually to go there. How strange. Huh. Interesting, okay. Among the file types that get created, and you've probably seen this if, you, if you've ever gone to this media cache location, CFA and peak files. So these are, uh, in, in terms of peak files, this is the waveform display um, of the audio component of your video and the CFA is the video, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the cached version of that video. When you see that it's like building your index of your media, that's what all of that is, okay? And you, though that media can get huge, again, based on the, uh, the original media that you're working in. If you're working with 720p media these days, it'll probably be a while before you actually needed to delete or clear out your caches. Um, if you're working in 4K and above regularly, go, go to this location and do a get, get info. I mean, it can be hundreds of gigs easily. Not always, but sometimes. Now, we've made it a lot easier to manage this stuff. So by the by default now, and this used to be a, this was a little, little, little sore point for a while, we do not delete these automatically, right? 
We don't want to delete anything. Now, the reason for this, and the reason that you want, like someone asked me on, on Twitter not long ago, why do I even want this stupid stuff? Why do I want peak files? Well, because won't they be generated when I open up a project anyway? And the answer is yes. Here's the thing, if you don't use them and save them, first of all, with them saved, the time to open a project that has tons of media, especially audio and video media, will be cut down significantly because it's already been cached. So it has to rebuild all of that. Sometimes you want to rebuild all of it if you get like corrupted media or a corrupt project. Sometimes, sometimes that can help. The other thing is that outside of that, um, how often do you keep all this stuff on your machine? You know, I have a, a goal like many of you. All right, I'm working on this project. And then after that, it goes to the archive. It goes to the raid. I don't need any of that cached media anymore because if I open it in a month, I'll worry about how long it's going to take to open it. So I pretty routinely every so often come in here and delete stuff, okay? Now you can have it automatically delete cache files older than three months. You can set this to whatever, all right? That's up to you. I don't recommend that, just pointing out here's where it is. All right, and then you have this automatically delete oldish cache files when cache exceeds and you can determine how big that is, all right? So you can set your cache to, you know, if you wanted to a terabyte, if you've got the space and you can say, all right, automatically delete stuff when it exceeds, you know, maybe you wouldn't set your cache to a terabyte again, maybe 250. So when it hits 250, anything that's going over that start deleting, nah, I don't like that either so much. I, I go for the manual choice here. So, and it even tells you, oh, there you go. Create a display audio waveforms, approved playback of media types. Regular cleaning of older used media can help maintain optimal performance. Deleted cached files will always be recreated whenever source media requires them. So that's the thing. Not a big deal. It's the speed of how quickly you get into Premiere by having those is where that's effective. All right. And here's where you can delete them. Now, similarly, let's go over to After Effects real quickly here. Um, you have a separate setting in there, media and disk cache. Okay. And this one, I think, will even tell you You've got two, you've got two options here. Yeah. So you have your empty disk cache option and then your clean database and cache. Okay. So, so here, this is going to caches, maximum disk cache, hundred gigs specific to after effects in this case, but then the conformed media is still going to that Lightroom video folder. I wonder if we just change that default location. Can someone tell me, can someone look and see if that's, yeah, I get, oh, Richard says it is. That that has to have changed. <laughs> I, do, I mean, it could be in the last six months, mind you. Probably haven't looked in a while, but there's no way that was the default for, you know, for the last couple of years. We must have updated that for whatever reason. And that's fine. No problem. My point is, again, if you want to go to empty this disk cache. Now, this is another example of like an After Effects. So if you're using, you know, whenever you see, let me see if any of my timelines here have it. Uh, it appears that they don't. Nothing is cached here. here. Okay. Um, when you see the blue line in After Effects, that's using like your global performance cache. So that's where it's caching frames, which it stores on disk. Yeah, those very frames, which again, enable instantaneous playback of your comps are stored here. So by emptying that over time, because again, it's, you know, you determine the size, but over time, that thing's going to get pretty full. So when you do empty disk cache, all right, it's going to tell you. Now look right there. <laughs> Proof, friends. I'm not, I'm not blowing smoke. Or am I sure I want to delete 112 gigs of disk cache? It's been a minute. Now I will say, towards the end of the year, I was doing a lot of stuff in After Effects and prep for that first masterclass. So I was opening up a ton of versions, ton of media, ton of projects caching things pre -re but that's a lot, right? That's a 20th of my total disk size. Okay. It's funny how my max disk cache is hundred, but there's 112 gigs in here. Um, probably because there's, this is shared, I think with Photoshop as well. So anyway, my point is do it, but do it knowing that, you know, if you're working on something, don't do it. If you're encountering issues, potentially do it. Understand that this is where it is. This can get filled up quickly. And based on your maximum size, it can also start to hinder performance if, if you don't have, you know, the ideal sort of free space there. Okay. We're going to cancel that. We'll, we'll do it another time. 
For now, I will keep working with it as it is, all right? So that's your caches. And again, you can delete media cache here, all right? Cancel, okay. All right, let's go into uh... <laughs> reverb mic. Don't go changing. I was just, I just heard that Billy Jill song. I love you just the way you are, the song. I mean, I'm sure I love you too, Mike, but uh, I've just heard that song yesterday or two days ago. All right. Quinn, I had that issue as well. My cash got sent to Lightroom. Yeah, it must be, um, it must be it. Okay. Very cool. So in a perfect world, best to have one system for editing and Adobe. Yeah, I mean, again, like, you could have one system. I mean, this this main machine that I'm on is for everything except streaming. That's a separate system. But drives and stuff, I definitely have specific drives for editing. Like now, especially, I got this whole raid thing happening. Dedicated drives for and media drives, especially, makes a huge difference. And again, if all the media is on that raid or whatever, that's where all your scratch disks should go. That's ideally where your caches could go. You know, um, we make it really easy to set all of those things. All right, let's check it out. You're good. Okay, yeah, that must be the new default. I guess we changed that. Interesting. Okay. All right, so let's talk now about um, preview files. We're kind of at the end here. And this is another one of those things where, you know, by understanding how these all work, it's going to make your life a little bit easier, especially if you're kind of as Mallory was describing earlier, you know, you're working on something and then, you know, you're working and kind of making decisions as you go, meaning that you'd like your render to be a little faster because you you know what you want ahead of time. And that's awesome. So what I'm doing here now is I'm just I'm just um, doing a little slight, slight color correction on this, maybe even stick a some kind of a cool LUT on here. Something that maybe just gives it a slightly more radical look. That's kind of cool. A lot of faded film on this. All right. That's neat. Okay. And I'm thinking this is this is handheld, so maybe we'll do a little warp stabilizer on this clip. All right. See how long that's going to take to process. Uh, 24 seconds or so. This is a lot faster than it used to be as well. Jorge de la Mora, thank you so much. You are very kind. Cash that paycheck. Don't leave an option for bouncing. Boom. I should. I know Kyle has all these sound effects set up. I should do that. I'm letting Kyle have that because he's kind of the. We all have our, you know, master class personalities. You know, Kyle's kind of he's 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 good with the dad joke stuff and the sound effects. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna let him have that. All right. Anyway, a little warp stabilizer. All right. With a little rack focus. Super cinematic for that my little Galaxian machine. All right. You get the idea. Now, again, this is performing really nicely on my proxy. I'm curious. You know, you know what's going to happen now. I'm going to turn this off, go into full media. It's going to play the same. But let's see. And it really is. I'm just getting lucky today. It's playing great. Okay. But again, we got four clips here. Oh, there we go. I started to drop some frames as I was rewinding. Fair enough. My point is that as you begin adding effects and things to multiple clips and actually doing an edit with stuff in it, right? Things may start slowing down. So let's go into the sequence settings menu. And we're going to pay attention to video previews. All right. So the purpose here is just that it's basically allowing you when you add effects and things to pre render stuff ahead of time. And those pre renders can be used on export. So once you render them in the timeline, you're like, all right, yep, that warp looks good. That color looks good. That clip is done. You don't have to render it again, meaning that your render time will be cut down for your final render through media encoder. All right. So really the main key is just choosing the format that's going to work best for you. Now it's still, we just changed our default cache location, but somehow we're still defaulting to iframe only MPEG, which is great if you're a broadcaster from 1997. 
But outside of that, no, that's not true. Some places still use iframe, MPEG, you know. Generally, of course, nobody wants to use anything interlaced. Also, why do we have P2 footage in here? No clue. These really all should go. No one wants to use this. Again, there are some broadcasters that do, but no one who no one knew who's shooting is going to need any of these. Really, there's two choices. GoPro Cineform, and I would choose this with Alpha 12-bit. It's a little heavy, bigger, but beautiful. Or QuickTime, and specifically, you know, for me, 422HQ, 444, if you need XQ, that's in here too. You've also got the QuickTime Wrap DNX. I don't recommend that. So I'm going to use 422HQ. All right, you can choose maximum bit depth, maximum render quality if you so desire. If you're not going to be scaling, uh, that isn't particularly necessary. Max bit depth, you can see. Setting the optimized rendering performance to memory is highly recommended when max quality or bit depth is rendering is on. Again, these are in your memory settings where you set the allocated memory for Premiere. Um, typically I have that bit set on performance, which is probably what you do too. All right. Click OK on this. So what's going to happen is, and let me just show you where that other setting is. All right. Under memory, you probably never even bothered to change this, right? Oh, look, we've changed the icons. They're not colored anymore. When did that change? That doesn't look good. Um, Performance or memory. Now it's saying when you're using the preview files for best uh, max bit depth, optimize for memory. So give it a shot. See what we're. I never change this from performance. I can't say I've seen a huge hit. I'm also not pre-rendering as much as I once used to. So you know that that can your mileage can vary there. But the key is render effects and work area. All right. Now what's going to happen is. As we start to render these different things, this could also apply um, if you do like a render and replace. Uh, you're just going to get that stuff out of that final render, and that's really going to speed things up because it's just it's just nice, you know. If I'm it's I do this in audio, right? If I get something that's good and solid, you know, finish it, pre-render it, be done with it, be done with it. So it's solid. I don't have to tweak it again. Now the really nice thing is if you Let's render the selection. Is it render entire work area? There we go, rendering entire work area. <laughs> if you do this, all right, and you can see now that this particular section is green. I always forget which one it is. All right. What's really cool about that is, um, again, it's just, it's just going to make the whole thing that much smoother. Scrubbing is, it's so fluid. All right. Oh, what's really cool is in this rack focus. Look at that. I was rack focusing all the way to the wall. You can see the the texture on the wall there. That's neat. I didn't notice that before. All right. And that's with the uh, I think that's with the twenty four to seventy Nikkor lens. Okay. If you were to add transitions and a graphic over that section, this is where I have a slowdown. Yes, of course. And that's again now certain transitions are going to be heavier than others. So if you have instances of that, Mallory, that's a perfect opportunity to do some video preview renders in advance. Absolutely. Because yeah, you'll render this clip. But if I, you know, if I do a, a cross dissolve or something onto this, it kind of screws it screws up the playback, right? So yes, that's that's a perfect reason to do that. If you're using lots of transitions, Again, not so commonly I'm using them anymore, but that's another good way to um, to kind of take that out of that final render pain that you may very well experience. All right. So that's video previews under sequence settings, max bit depth, again, switching from memory to performance. We talked about caches. We talked about using the proxy files. We talked about exporting with proxies. We talked about exporting with your native media. Again, reconnecting it is simple as just clicking the toggle proxy button. Also showed you the fractional playback settings. Oh, and one more thing before I end here. Let me just go back to my screen one more one more time. So we talked about fractional playback. Again, if you're not going to use proxies, or even if you are, you know, if things are slowing down, you can also choose to view your footage as you're playing back in quarter res, which is going to look a little more pixelated. But when you stop, it'll sharpen up. You, of course, have those settings for pause and play. And I always have my pause res set to full, even if playback is not on full. Um, the other thing is, is that if you truly want to see 
every pixel as it will be delivered, you can enable this high quality playback option here too. Just keep in mind that while that's going to look, that's basically a, a, a true, I don't wanna say lossless, it is exactly pixel for pixel, what you're seeing is what you're gonna get kind of a thing. Um, that too can hinder overall performance. So as you saw, I don't typically keep that on, okay? And then if you're sending out via transmit to an external monitor or something, you definitely want that setting on. But that's also where doing some pre-renders in the timeline can help you, all right? So my friends, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you so much. Yeah, Mike is saying you might want to render all before trying to show it to the client. Absolutely, definitely. And again, use those display LUTs if they're not used to seeing uh, log footage. Until next time, have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. I believe we've got the Illustrator Daily Creative Challenge coming up next, so stick around for that. And uh, have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Stay tuned next week for music, music, music. Get your music on. Also, I'm going to be polling questions about audition. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.